Hi everyone. This video is meant to be kind of a beginner's guide to learning the command line in the context of FreeSurfer. So FreeSurfer, like many other neuroimaging packages, is a command-based software that uses the Unix terminal as its primary interface as opposed to a graphical interface that people are generally more familiar with. And because of this, one of the main things that FreeSurfer newcomers initially struggle with is getting the hang of the command line environment and knowing how to fully capitalize on using the terminal to do exactly what they want it to do, whether that be scripting, high-level processing pipelines, or simply copying files between directories. So this demo is meant to bridge that gap and lay down the fundamentals that you can really hit the ground running once you start learning how to process your own experimental data. I also just want to quickly mention that this demo is really geared towards those who have like practically no experience with the shell. And anyone more familiar with the command line might want to skip through to the second half of the video where I'll talk more specifically about FreeSurfer. Also, I really want to stress to those who are completely new to this, please try not to feel intimidated by the command line. We're going to move through a fair amount of potentially foreign information fairly quickly, and you definitely shouldn't expect for all of it to be completely retained. Shell scripting is very much like a language. There's just no way you're going to immediately know it all magically after a half hour video. The only way to become truly comfortable is through direct experience actually plugging away at the terminal. The main goal here is just to acquire a basic understanding of running commands and navigating the file system because when it comes down to it, that's how you use FreeSurfer and it's very difficult to be an effective FreeSurfer user without at least some low level familiarity of how the command line works. So that being said, uh, let's get started. So first things first, let's open up our window into the underlying kernel via the terminal. And by the way, this is meant to be a demo that can easily be followed along with whether or not you're on a Mac or a Linux operating system. So on both Mac and Linux, the terminal is a standard application installed by default. And so we can just search for that. And you should see a terminal window that looks something like this. Now I'll try to take it somewhat slow here in the beginning to drive home a few points. But every time you open up a new terminal, you are initiating a new shell or a new environment of sorts. Now, this is a pretty big generalization, but you can think of it almost like logging onto your computer as you would normally. But instead of opening up a graphical desktop where you have some fancy buttons and a cool wallpaper from your last vacation, you just have this basic text interface as a way to interact with your machine. And so each time you open up a new terminal environment, you're in a way starting a new session on your computer and it's just the non-graphical command line only session where you're still logged in with your normal account and where you can still manipulate files and run particular programs as you would normally. Now let's take a look at our shell in a bit more detail. So first we see that the terminal consists of an initial prompt with some text followed by an opportunity to type in commands. Now if I press the return key a bunch of times, I'm submitting an empty command and nothing happens. But this prefix here keeps returning, prompting me for the next command. I could also type some random nonsense and press enter, and then I'll just get some appropriate error saying this nonsense command does not exist. So the prompt in your environment might be a bit different than mine, and this is a customizable thing, but usually the default prompt will first provide the name of the current account, the name of the computer that you're currently using, or the host name, and then followed by the name or path of the current working directory. So in our command line environment, everything you see here and any potential action you can perform is controlled by the underlying shell or the scripting language, which in our case is bash, which you might have heard of before. There are a few other common shell scripting languages like C shell or Z shell, which is a bit newer, but bash is by far the most common on modern systems. And so one concept that's really useful when you're first kind of familiarizing yourself with the command line is the idea that the shell environment is in its simplest form, uh, a navigator for your file system. You've all hopefully seen something like the Finder before, a file system browser on Windows. I think it's called the File Explorer. Um, and it's helpful to think of the shell as pretty much the same thing. Um, in your environment, you will always be located within some directory in your file system, just like how in the Finder here, I'm currently located in my home folder. Um, and so in the terminal, the easiest way to find out what directory that you are in right now is using the command PWD, which stands for Print Working Directory. So simply typing PWD on the command line and pressing enter will print out the path to my current location, which is in slash users slash Andrew. 
And usually by default, opening up a new shell will initialize the working directory to your home folder, hence why I run the command, it prints out users and true. And of course, for you guys, it'll be a bit different. And just like how in my file browser, I can see the contents of the directory that I'm currently in, we can do the same thing in the terminal with the command ls, which stands for list contents. So running the ls command on its own will print all files and folders stored in the current directory. Oftentimes, files are displayed in regular white text, while directories are often bolded or colorized, but this might depend a bit on your personal settings. Now, what if we want to list the contents of a directory that we aren't currently located in? To do this, we can introduce the concept of a command argument, which is any input or space-separated groups of input directly following the command. So in our example for ls, Let's say we want to probe the contents of some other directory in our file system. For example, let's use the slash user slash bin directory, which is commonly available on all Unix-like systems. If we type ls followed by our target directory slash user slash bin, we get a whole list of system files and programs printed out to the screen. Great, so we can look at the contents of a folder that we aren't currently located in. But what if we actually want to move into another directory? For this, we can use the command cd, short for change directory, pretty straightforward. And just like with our last example, cd will accept some folder path as a primary argument. So first, I'm just going to run ls again to see what we have in this directory. And we can see that one of the subfolders we have here is called tutorial. Let's cd into there. So we'll just type cd space tutorial, enter. And to absolutely guarantee that I'm in the tutorial directory, I will run pwd to print out the working directory. And it should display the new path as it does. Great. So, so far we've covered three ways to explore the file system structure. pwd to print the working directory, ls to list the contents of any specific folder, and cd to change the current directory. But now let's actually start to add things, manipulate files, and get our hands dirty. So let's create a new directory. The command for this is also pretty straightforward, makedir, M-K-D-I-R, um, which stands for, of course, make directory. Now you can call this folder whatever you want, but I'm gonna call it something boring and uncreative like new folder. And once again, the folder name is the main argument to the command. So makedir new folder, and as soon as I press enter, you can actually see that this new directory is immediately reflected uh, in the file browser on the right. So we've made a new folder. Now let's make an actual text file. Let's move into our new directory for now. But first I want to quickly go over one important aspect of how relative paths work in the shell. So first we'll cd into new folder. So now I'm in this new directory, and we can just guarantee that by typing pwd, just for uh, tutorial's sake. But what if I want to go back up into the parent directory, the directory from which we came? Um, on the command line, the relative parent directory can be indicated via the dot dot. So if I wanted to move back up the folder structure, I could, of course, just type out cd and then the full directory path. Or I could run as a shortcut cd dot dot and enter, and now I've gone back into the parent directory. So this is a useful trick to know, and this isn't just specific to the cd command. You can point to any path this way. For example, if I wanted to check out the contents of the directory, maybe two levels above where I currently am, I can chain the double dots in the path like this, ls dot dot slash dot dot, or I could also um, make a new folder, but I can make it in the parent directory and I could do mkdir dot dot slash new folder two. And so you'll probably come across these specifiers in a path eventually. And I just wanted to point that out. Now let's go back to the original folder we created with cd new folder. In here, let's create an empty text file called new file dot txt. The command touch will create an empty file. So let's just run touch new file.txt, but now what if we want to edit it? So here is where 
Um, things will differ depending on whether you're using a Mac or a Linux machine. On Mac, you can just run open new file.txt, which will automatically open up the file in the text edit app. However, this command isn't available on most Linux distributions. Um, but what you can do is specify exactly which program you'd like to open the file with. So in this case, I'd recommend using the tool called gedit. So for those using Linux, just type gedit space new file.txt and a text editor should pop right up. So let's go to text edit and just add something random. Maybe I'll write um, free surfer is cool. And then just save that and get out of that window. Now our file has some content. And one way we can actually display this content while still staying within the confines of the terminal is with the command cat, which will print out the contents of a file or a list of files to the screen. So there are a few different ways to view text files on the command line. Cat is of course one of them and it does the job, but if you have some huge text file, you might not want to crowd up the terminal with all of the output. So you could use the command less. And let me just find some super long log to use as an example. You can use less to actually scroll through the document and search through, and you can eventually exit out hitting the Q button. Anyway, moving on. Now let's make a copy of this file using the command CP, which stands for copy. The correct syntax here actually requires two arguments. The first being the name of the file to copy and the second being the target name. So in this case, let's call our copied file new file copied.txt. Okay, done, copied. But now maybe we decide we don't actually like that name and want to call it something else like just copied file. We can rename files with the move command, mv. Now using a move command to just rename a file might seem somewhat unintuitive at first, but you kind of have to think about files simply as objects with path names on the file system. Therefore, renaming a file is just a matter of modifying the underlying file path. So let's rename our file with mv. First argument should be the name of the file to move, and the second should be the target name. We can also just move this file into a different directory if we wanted to by supplying a directory name as a second target argument. So let's use our uh, trick we know for specifying the relative parent directory. And we can move our file just up a level with mv copied file dot dot. Now, if we run ls, we see it's no longer around, and we can ls the parent directory and find it there. And lastly, to delete files, we'll use the command rm. So for the sake of demonstration, I'll just make an empty file called delete me with the touch command. Then deleting it is simply a matter of running rm delete me. Now, rm can be a dangerous command to run. It's not like in most graphical interfaces and file browsers where if you delete something, it'll send it right to the trash can where you can recover it if necessary. Once you rm something, it's pretty much gone for good. Now, what if we want to delete a whole directory and everything else underneath it? We can try to delete our directory that we just made. So first, let's cd up into the parent and then type rm new folder. But once we press enter, we get this error saying new folder as a directory, which to be honest is a pretty terrible error. It doesn't really tell you any details about what the problem actually is, but the real issue here is that rm expects by default for the arguments to be a list of singular files. But what we really want is for the command to recurse through a directory and remove all things underneath it one by one. So for this, we'll have to introduce the concept of options or flags, which are just other components of the anatomy of a command. In this case, for rm, we want to turn on two different options, the dash r and the dash f flags, which we can combine. The dash r option will enable a recursive delete and the dash F will force a deletion of all files and directories without prompting for any delete warnings. So now when we run rm rf new folder, with our new options, it completes successfully and we can say goodbye to our created directory. So these kinds of flags and options are very common in command line tools and in fact can be pretty much found in any executable. A couple of ways to view the documentation for all possible options in an executable is to run man and then the name of the program and the documentation will usually pop up and you can scroll through and then press Q to leave the window. Not all commands, however, have help text available through uh, the man function. And another common option for viewing documentation might be supplying the dash H or the dash dash help flag to the command. This is actually the case for all free surfer binaries. So for example, say you want to know 
a little bit more about how to use the free surfer command MRI convert. If you run MRI convert dash dash help, you get all of this helpful documentation printed right to the screen. So now let's take a couple steps back and apply a helpful flag to a command that we already know, ls. Normally ls will just print out the names of the files and folders, but when you provide the dash l flag, things get a little more descriptive. So when I run ls dash l in the current directory, we now see a lot more info for each file. We have, working from right to left, the modification time of the file, its size and bytes, its associated group, and the file owner. And these last two parameters bring us to a discussion of the combination of letters and dashes over here in the leftmost column. This region represents the file or directory permissions. So let's take a closer look at what that really means. So we can just ignore the first character here, which simplified just represents whether or not the path is a directory. So excluding that, we have nine individual spaces for characters, which you can then break up into three separate sections. The first section designates the user permissions, which correspond to the account that created the file. The second section designates the group permissions, as all files can be optionally associated with a particular group. And the last section here designates the permissions for everyone else. So these character combinations can be modified with the chmod command, but I won't get too into the details of that now. What you really need to know is that in each section, uh, the three character spaces represent a type of permission. So if there's a dash, then that permission is turned off. But if there is a letter there, then that permission is turned on. So the first character will either be an R or a dash. The R means readable. So in the case of the first section, the owner of the file had permissions to read it. And then R for the group permissions mean anyone in the file's group can also read it. And the final R in the last section indicates that everyone else has permissions to read it as well. So this is a file that can be opened by anyone. The next character in each section designates the right permissions and the third character in each section indicates permission to execute the file, uh, which is something that just applies to commands or executables. The most common and usually the default set of permissions is here with files readable by all, but only writable by the file owner and associated group members. Of course, permissions can play an important role in keeping your subject data safe and secure, so it's a good idea to have some baseline knowledge of how this all works. Anyway, so far we've pretty much covered all of the most commonly used system commands for navigating around the terminal and modifying files. So now I'll spend some time talking about how to use more advanced features of the shell environment and how that fits into FreeSurfer. As I mentioned before, the terminal operates via some shell command language, which is usually bash on modern systems. And in bash, just like at the core of any computer language, we have the ability to create and use variables. Now, 99% of the time when using a shell scripting language, your variables will just be storing text or string data and not any abstract variable types that you might find in a normal programming language. So as an example, let's just create our own variable. In bash, the syntax for variable definition requires the name, an equal sign without spaces, and then the quoted string. So for our example, let's just make some variable named uh, myVar. And we can set that equal to some message, maybe just Hello world. Technically, double quotes or single quotes can be used here. Uh, they do mean something a little bit different, but in this context, it doesn't really matter. Um, you also don't have to use quotes at all in this particular example, but it's really best practice, and we'll try to keep it organized here. So now we have a variable called myVar in our shell, but how do we access it? Let's use the command called echo to print a message to the terminal. I could write echo, um, this is my message, run the command, and we can see that it's immediately printed or echoed back to the screen. So we can use this command to print out the contents of our myVar. And we just have to specify to the interpreter that we want myVar to be understood as an actual variable and not just some arbitrary word. We can do that by prefacing the variable with a dollar sign. So let's just run echo, this is my message, and then dollar sign myVar making sure we preface our variable name with a dollar sign, and then looking at our output, we see that my bear has been replaced with its contents. And if we didn't have the dollar sign, the interpreter is just gonna think that the literal text my bear is exactly what we want, and we'll print that out verbatim. Now I'm gonna to touch on a slightly more advanced idea that plays an important role in the shell. We have this variable that we've defined, but right now it's only available to us in our local scope. And by this, I mean we can access it in our current bash process, but if we wanted to run a separate command that actually checked the contents of our variable, for example, 
this command will fail because my var has not actually been propagated to any spawn processes. To show a more intuitive example of this, I've written a simple script here called read setting that just prints whether or not a particular setting is enabled or disabled by reading some variable that we set called my setting. By default, if my setting is empty or just simply not found, it will print the following message saying that you know, the setting is disabled. So let's try to enable it. I will set a variable my setting, all caps, equal to on, but when we try to run the script again, we get the same message. So even though my setting is available to us in the immediate shell, and I can show this by just echoing its contents, to get this to work correctly, we need to actually propagate the variable so that it's also available to all sub-processes of this shell. And we can do this by exporting it as an environment variable, meaning it's defined across the entire environment and will be available to any commands run from this shell. A previously defined variable can be turned into an environment variable with the export command, or you can also just define an environment variable in one line as you would a normal variable, as long as it's prefaced with export. And so now that we've exported my setting, we can rerun our script and see that it now successfully reads the contents of our environment variable. So hopefully that makes some sense. It might feel a bit foreign now, but I'll actually come back to the concept of environment variables in a little bit as I move this discussion into the context of FreeSurfer. So FreeSurfer provides literally hundreds of commands available for file manipulation and analysis. Just like how we have system commands like ls and cd and rm that we've covered, FreeSurfer has programs like mri-info, mri-convert, mri-binarize, recon-all, etc., etc. The list goes on. Recon all, by the way, is the main pipeline for processing a T1 image. It does subcortical and cortical segmentations and parcellations, and it produces a whole set of statistics surrounding your subject or subjects. However, even after downloading FreeSurfer into some directory by following the instructions on our website, you might notice that after just typing recon all in the terminal, you get an error saying this program was not found, just like what I'm getting here. And so the reason I'm getting this error is because by default, when you open up a terminal, FreeSurfer is not just magically available to you. And to understand why this is the case, let's take a look into how the shell actually runs commands in the first place. So in your shell, you have an environment variable called path in all caps. And if we echo path to check its contents, we see that it consists of a group of directory paths separated by colons. If you were to actually take a look at the contents of each of these directories, you would see that they all contain a bunch of scripts and binaries and executables, some of which you might recognize like ls and rm and pwd. So when you run a command like pwd in the terminal, what's actually happening behind the scenes is a search throughout each of the directories in your path variable one by one until it finds an executable called pwd. Once it finds that file in any of the paths, it'll immediately stop searching and execute that script or binary. So knowing this, in order to actually use FreeSurfer on the command line, we have to add the directory where we've installed FreeSurfer into our path environment variable. Fortunately, since there are a few things that need to be configured, we provide a shell script that sets up all of this stuff and takes care of the dirty work for you. This process is called sourcing FreeSurfer, and it's something that you need to do every time you use it. So here are the steps needed to source FreeSurfer. First, you will, first you will set an environment variable called FreeSurfer Home in all caps which is very important because this variable is used by almost every FreeSurfer command. You should set this variable equal to the path where you've installed FreeSurfer. Usually on a Mac, this will be in application slash FreeSurfer. And on Linux, it's kind of up to whoever actually downloaded it, but usually it's in user slash local or the opt directory. Once that's done, you can run the sourcing, which requires running the system command source on a script in our FreeSurfer home called setupfreeSurfer.sh. So first we type source, then dollar sign FreeSurfer home to designate the variable representing our path to the install, then slash setup FreeSurfer.sh. Once you run that, you should see a few lines detailing information about our FreeSurfer version and configured paths. And after that, you should be good to go and can go ahead and run FreeSurfer commands like recon all or MRI info or open up Freeview, the visual interface. Now, you might be thinking, I have to run this every time I open up a new terminal? And the short answer is no, you don't. You can automate the whole process, but you have a few options here and it depends a bit on your needs. In Bash, you have a way to run things automatically every time you start a new shell. And that is by editing the Bash RC or the Bash profile if you're on Mac, which is stored in your home directory and gets run every time you start up 
uh, a new bash environment. So let's take a look at that real quick. To CD into your home, you can run CD with just no arguments, or you can also just run CD with a tilde as an argument, as the tilde is kind of like a shortcut for home. So one thing I haven't really mentioned yet is that when you run the ls command normally, you're not necessarily seeing all the files in that directory. Any file name that is prefaced with a period is actually considered a hidden file and isn't shown by default. Don't worry though, you haven't missed out on much. Most of these files are just configuration settings and are hidden for a reason. The bashrc is one of those files. And it's a file that gets sourced every time you open up a terminal or initiate a new bash process. Now before you get confused, I just want to mention that Macs are a bit of a unique case here in the sense that bash profile is what gets run at startup. So I'll be editing that, but all of you Linux folks should be editing the bash rc. Anyway, I'm going to open the startup file in a text editor. I like to use Sublime Text, which I recommend. Now I already have a few lines of code here, which you can ignore, but whatever I add in this script will be run every time I open the shell. So if I were to add our two special lines needed to source FreeSurfer, first exporting FreeSurfer home, and then calling the setup script, every time I open a new terminal, FreeSurfer will be fully sourced and instantly ready to go. So that's one thing you can do, but say you don't want to actually source things for every startup and instead just want to maybe make the sourcing process a bit easier. For example, maybe you're a FreeSurfer power user and you like to switch between the stable and development versions fairly quickly. But maybe you don't want to type out a long set of paths every time. Bash makes it easy to create command shortcuts called aliases, and I'm going to squeeze these sourcing commands into one of these shortcuts. The syntax for an alias is like this. First, the alias keyword. Then the desired alias command name, let's just call it SFS for source free surfer. Next, an equal sign, just like when you're creating a variable. And then in quotes, we'll put in the commands that we want to run. The semicolons here can be used to merge multiple commands onto a single line. So it's basically taking place of the new line character. So I'll save this startup file once again. And if I open up another terminal, just as expected, free surfer is no longer sourced automatically, but I can just run my shortcut alias command named SFS, and there you go. So of course, the way you use your shell is completely up to you. Everyone has their own habits and preferences when it comes to using the terminal. So it's all about finding what's most efficient for your goals and workflow. And now that we've covered sourcing FreeSurfer, you should be ready to start exploring its functionality on your own. We've covered a fair amount for a beginner introduction, I'd say, so I think we'll stop there. I hope this was helpful in some way, and if you're looking for more information, there's plenty of more Unix documentation and FreeSurfer tutorials linked on our wiki, so you should definitely check out the FreeSurfer website.